my line? I always laugh before I say this. Hi, I'm Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan. Hey, I'm Nate. Hello, I'm Steve. Welcome to Dungeon Vets Book Talk. Today, we'll be covering Patrick Rothfuss' first installment of the King Killer Chronicle, The Name of the Wind. If this is your first time watching, we are the Dungeon Vets, military veterans that take fantasy and science fiction concepts from books, movies, video games, whatever, and we take a look at how it would exist within the D&D 5e rules and mechanics. And we talk about inspirations you can take from it and use as a player or DM at your own table. So, let's get into it. This isn't any of our first times reading this, right? Or listening to it? No, it's my my second time reading through it. Third, I believe, for me. And it's my second time as well. I read it the first time, and I listened to it uh, this time in preparation for this recording. I did some reading and some listening this time because I was uh, running out of time, actually, and I needed to make use of (laughs) all the driving time I had available, so I started listening to it as well. But overall... Let's give some ratings, shall we? What, Ryan, what did you think of the book? What's your um, rating? The first time I read it, it was it not just come out, but I was, it was definitely like at this point maybe six or seven years ago, and I was just getting into fantasy again. Uh, and so I liked it a lot more. It, it bring, brought a lot of concepts that I really wasn't familiar with, and now I'm a lot more familiar with. So I uh, back then I would have given it like a four and a half, but now – Probably about a three and a half. I did not enjoy it as much the second time around, personally. What about you, Steve? I very much agree with what Ryan just said. Um, The first time I read this book, I was enthralled. And I do want to say that I think that a couple of things that Rothfuss does really well is his history and his world building, his mythology, and how we get glimpses of that throughout the book and throughout the other books as well, it's very well done, super intriguing, and there's clearly a ton of thought that went into the nuance of most things in his world. I think, though, that on rereads, this book can suffer a little bit, because though it is done cleverly, you're getting told a lot, explained to a lot, and it just wasn't quite as enjoyable for me the second time around. And so I also rated it three and a half out of five stars. I think that I would have rated it higher after the first go round. Um, yeah, there, there's something just tangibly different about Quoth from everyone else, right? Like he has a knack maybe for learning and, or something, but not knowing he, or maybe he's somebody reborn, but not knowing exactly what makes him just seem a little too good, a little too awesome. I tried really hard to look past that, but since we're only looking at this one book that isn't truly meant to be looked at as a standalone, it's hard to move past that, you know? And so I rated it three out of five, three and a half out of five stars. Yeah, uh, I would agree with both of you in that uh, I would have rated it higher or I enjoyed it more on my first read. Um, it's been quite a while since I read it, at least a couple of years, probably three, maybe four. Um, I, and so I, uh, I, I'd kind of forgotten a lot of it, you know, since then. But I honestly kind of struggled to give this one a, a rating that I was really confident in. Um, I think I'm probably around both of y'all, maybe a three to 3.5, because I feel like there is, it's well done. There's a lot to dislike. Most of that, I think, kind of like you mentioned a little bit, revolves around Quoth and the fact that he's kind of a Mary Sue. However, even on my second read, I found myself still like wanting to find out what's, what happens next. I, wanna, I wanted to get to the end of the story. I want to see, like, okay, well, how does this wrap up, you know? And what, is it, what does it do after? Uh, yeah, I think I'm right around there, probably a 3.5 as well. The story is great, uh, and the world building is amazing. Uh, the amount of detail he puts into the book for the world building, not just the world building itself, but uh, paying mind to it, you know, he puts a spotlight on the world building throughout many chapters. So I, I definitely appreciate that. But yeah, and I think the reason, you know, uh, you know the episode of Always Sunny where he's got the, the, the painting of the dog and it's smug aura mocks Frank? Quoth's smug aura mocks me. That's that's <laughs> yeah. the way I feel. And I was just like, I don't like it. I, 
It's smug aura mocks me. He's, you know, he's so naturally great at everything, and he know, and the way he carries himself, mostly like when he's, when we're outside of, like when he's the narrator or the things that he does when Close he's the describing innkeeper. his life, you could get a, you could get upset about how grandiose and amazing some of those are. But to be fair, we're we're reading a fantasy story, and the protagonist is supposed to do some of those things. But the level of just like horrible deference that seems to be given to the innkeeper is a little nauseating. It's and it's and they're like they mention it. It's like this guy's twenty five years old. And I granted he's one out of a billion. He might be somebody reborn. I've never met a twenty five year old that made me think, <laughs> Holy crap, he's so old and mature and I just he's so fey. I yeah, it's a little hard to stomach. <laughs> It must be they're just in a world of terribly mundane people, and he is. You know, yeah, he is just simply not. Uh, but that's not that's not fair to say because there are a lot of very uh, people out there who uh, rival Quoth in certain aspects. But all right, so the book uh, basically starts out. If uh, do we want to skip the the uh, IRL sequences or go straight into like as Quoth is telling the story of his life? It, it starts off, the, the concept is that this dude is sitting down to get Quoth's story and, and write it all out so he can get, like, the real story from the man himself. And so Quoth sits down, and it's him telling us his story. Uh, and so that's all in the first person, and it's kind of telling of, of his past. Uh, he starts off as a part of the uh, Dima Roo, a sort of traveling performer uh, type of folk. It seems like it's heavily, uh, that culture's heavily implied to be or just inspired from gypsies and yes. then traveling performers and stuff. Yeah, it reminded me of uh, the traveling people in Wheel of Time is what came to mind for me. Although they're less about performing, but they still have that same stigma that like, oh, they're going to come around and steal your stuff. Yeah, they're they're different flavored gypsies. Um, yeah. These are, these are troop flavored gypsies. <laughs> um, so Quoth is, is born into this. His parents are part of the troupe. They're performers. They travel from town to town. And when he is a child, he meets an arcanist who is part of their troupe. And he teaches, starts to teach him things and give him glimpses of little pieces of magic. And this is what really spurs Quoth to really want to learn magic. And it's also where we get the start of who Quoth really is, which is someone who is just naturally good at everything yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, uh, from Abenthi, or Ben as he calls him, he starts picking up things and learning at, at, at a crazy pace. You know, he's like that, I just saw some 13-year-old got accepted into medical school. Like, that's Quoth. <laughs> yeah, the, the entire beginning of his childhood before his family's massacred. Uh, but before that is just excuses to be like, yeah, here's why he's so amazing. Here's going to set up all of the things that he's able to do that normal people can't. Uh, he learns faster than everyone else. He only needs to be have something explained once or twice. Uh, he just picks up concepts very well, and he is smarter than you. This guy rolled an 18 in intelligence, and then uh, he also rolled an 18 in charisma. Yes, he did. <laughs> and the other ones are okay. Are, 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 yeah. His other stats are more he, or less normal. He's still a child, right? So he's going to have lower dexterity and lower con. They get better over time. But he started off with those two 18s and his intelligence <laughs> <laughs> and his charisma. Um, but yeah, you mentioned it. His, his troop, his family gets massacred. And he then lives on the streets of this huge city for... He's homeless for three years before he finally ends up going to the university to learn the magic that he wants to learn. So once he gets to the university, he makes some friends, he gains some mentors, and he makes some enemies, some antagonists. He, we see several different sequences and events that take place at the university that's really just there to demonstrate how he gained his mighty reputation. They're not really attached to the overall story as a whole yet. I don't think we could say that they are. Or no, not. and I found that kind of interesting that this whole book is a lot of background stuff. We're not really touching on much of why Quoth is such a legend. And, and yeah, this is like his backstory. We get a little bit of it, like where he gets the nickname Quoth the Bloodless. But otherwise, it's like this is just a kid scrambling around to figure out a way to, to find out more about what killed his family. We don't really get any kind of like, wow, this is some big legendary hero stuff. 
some of it is, I wouldn't call it mundane necessarily, but definitely not the stuff you would expect to hear of legends, you know. Well, I imagine that's his point or his goal was to show how stories get distorted over time. And he didn't actually call down fire and lightning yeah. like Tabulin the Great. He used a little bit of sympathy to make a big flash to blind the guy. That's that's one of the events that happens to him while he's at school. Is he gets attacked on the street by bandits, you know, assassins. Very typical D and D encounter, I might add. And he handles it in kind of typical D and D fashion too. He uses a couple of spell slots, even if they're not quite as grandiose as the rumors make it. You know, he used lightning bolt. It's like no, he just used a, a spark and some some powder, which I imagine is something like. I forget what he calls it, but I imagine like magnesium, which burns like very brightly in these big flashes and stuff. But in this world, it's a very low magic setting. Most people don't know anything about magic, and so they blow it out of proportion. They they turn it into something that it's not. But the whole he goes to the university to try to learn more about the people that killed his family, because I just kind of glossed over that. But his family got killed by evil creatures of myth and legend. The Chandrian. They are the the boogeymen, the original witches, the stuff like that of the legend. And they were real, and he saw them, he spoke to them, and then they fled right before anything else could happen. So he wants to learn more about these... Chandrian. And it's very frustrating. He doesn't learn anything about it. He can't get into the archives because he gets tricked into breaking a rule. But he eventually does hear a piece of gossip that allows him to go north and look into this wedding massacre that happened because there are rumors that it could have been perpetrated by the Chandrian. And there he, quote-unquote, fights a dragon. Slays a dragon, even. But it's a little bit different than typical D&D fashion. <laughs> I won't go too much into that. Um, and also a huge part of this book is it's a twisty, curvy dance of a romance with yes. Miss Denna. I am not normally a person who, who particularly enjoys uh, romance in novels. I, you know, I, I don't hate it, um, but it's never something, been something that really fascinated me. But I remember the first time reading this, and like, I really enjoy this little romance arc of him, like, never being able to quite, you know, find or hold on to, to his dream girl here. And the fact that they both really like each other, but their circumstances keep kind of tearing them away. I agree. It is very compelling stuff. Um... And he does eventually call the name of the wind and become kind of a full-fledged arcanist who has now touched the real magic-y sort of magic that this world has to offer. And he's going to try to learn more about that. And that's where the book ends. Let's uh, start talking about D&D in it. this world. So this takes place in the Four Corners, which is a, uh, a European uh, peninsula. Um, but, you know, not super, not really. And it takes place, at least for this book, predominantly in the Commonwealth, uh, which is host to Tarbian, where Kvothe spends his urchin life, uh, and the Imre in the university, where he spends his university days. The university is where he learns. It is the magical college. It is the Hogwarts yeah. of this world, uh, which... For D&D, having Hogwarts is it's awesome. A, and this is a great example of one with all the different fields that they kind of have in there, like the, you yeah. know, the the Medica, the, the the Artificery. That one is really cool. That's probably the most interesting one to me. This little pocket of civilization within the Commonwealth uh, with Imre and the University hosts any number of D&D backstories for you. You have College of Barding that you could put, uh, Artificery. You have the different schools of wizardry uh, that you feel are applicable as a DM to put in this area, all for your characters to build off of. If you just set the main story that everyone had to be from Imre, the University, or Tarbian, you could have every class basically represented, except for maybe Barbarian. Um, maybe, yeah. What I especially liked, and something you could consider if you do, especially if you have like a low magic campaign, or even, you know, a low-ish magic campaign, the, the reputation that the, that the arcanists have and the university has um, is pretty interesting, especially in, like, Imre and the surrounding area. They're like, we don't really trust this sort of magic stuff because it's weird to us, but we see how it could be useful. 
because they'll they'll have them like fix their stuff or bring them like sympathy lamps, I think. So they want to use stuff, but they're very mistrusting of this stuff that they don't understand, which especially if you're running a low magic campaign, I think is something great to put in there is how how are people going to react to to not only this to, to like this place where they're learning how to do this weird stuff and also out in the world, you know. I think it's always a good idea to wear uh, if you're running a campaign where you're visiting a big city and then you're going to these small podunk kind of towns, they don't view things the same. Uh, they don't have the same opportunities. They might never see an arcanist or a wizard in their entire lives. Uh, so playing these small towns, RPing in a small town, these people might be in utter amazement that your cleric can heal in a plague that they've been suffering just with a, you know, a snap of his fingers. And I think he does that well. Arcanists are mysterious because they hold so many secrets that, you know, just don't come up in daily rural life. And they could be, they could be in awe of like, wow, this is amazing, uh, which feels great as a player, you know, you go and like, I go be impressive, you know, uh, or they could be hostile. Like, I don't understand this. I don't like things that I don't understand. Uh, you know, whatever you need to throw in there. So the utter spectrum of culture in this book is amazing. Uh, you get to see and hear about so many different types of people who are all in this generally small area. And that's realistic. And Totally. You know, A plus, a plus to that. Great world building and a lot of things you could sort of cherry pick for your own setting and campaign. I, the, the university, I think, is probably the, when we talk about creating a and d campaign based off of this, the university is probably the single best example that we have based on the story that we see. Sure, you can make some sort of political thing between countries. You can have the big Dracus at the end. You know, you can make it even bigger. You could make it an actual dragon in D&D and threaten a town. But... If you take the story of what he does, you could have a party of, you know, maybe the party is Willem and Simon and Manette also, but everyone has their own speciality within the university. Somebody's a wizard, somebody's more of a fighter. You could probably make the university, if you're doing it in D&D, more expansive than it already is. You can include martial classes and music classes and things like that to cover the whole spectrum of D&D classes. And because it's so huge and secretive and there's this massive crawling under dungeon and this four-plate door in the library that nobody knows what's behind, there's so many different conflicts and encounters that you can just put into the university to expand it out in different directions with more lore. And you could eventually find, I think, some sort of thing to just centralize your entire campaign right there at the university. There could be a bad guy and a plot all right there, and you would never have to travel to any other town. There there are a lot of opportunities for, for content right in the university without having to travel a whole lot, which is can, can be convenient for you as a DM, you know, not having to make up new places all the time. I've never done anything like that. That'd be pretty interesting. It'd be great. I would love to play. That's not normally the flavor of campaign I like to run. But I would love to play, and you know, you have Hogwarts and you have Hogsmeade. Yeah, those the, the you have the town outside this this massive school, and you have the school itself. Um, and you know, martial classes, even if they're not part of this magic school, the school's got to have guards, or maybe yeah. the uh, the town itself over has to have guards. And it would be easy enough to make any excuse to have a martial character. If you take the university itself, you have the opportunities for the uh, for the the Arcanum to be a dungeon and you have the under thing as a dungeon and you have possibly the surrounding woods a really great way i would say to to handle your your like tier one gameplay of your first like you know five levels or so um and then maybe after that you know if things have gone that way they could like graduate and now there are these, you know, at fifth level, say, they go out into the world with the reputation that a fifth level character is kind of intended to have. Yeah, totally. You get yourself a little reputation while you're there and you have the onset. And then you have this entire wide world that you get to explore. Uh, yeah, and it's a nice uh, tutorial area for levels one to five. You know, this is a school with a bunch of kids. 
or or adults if you want to put it in your world that you don't want to deal with teenage characters. Yeah. It also uh, gives you as a DM a lot of time to develop things, uh, to develop the world that surrounds the university, and you can kind of tailor that to what to the character development and things you see and establish during these first few levels at the university. You know, if we just look at the if we look at the encounters that Quoth goes through at his time, it's it's all great stuff, especially for low level. Like you got to convince some master to take you into their class so that you can learn the stuff that your wizard class or your fighter class or whatever you are needs to learn. It's part of it's part of you getting into the higher levels of your class is you need to advance in the school so you have to go and convince a master. And maybe your persuasion role sucks and then with D&D, you could just be like, okay, well then what you need to do for me is go get this item for me. Little mini quest. And then they can advance that way. He, when he saves Fella from the fire, that's a really cool, dangerous, non-combat encounter that can take place in the school. The sympathy duels, those are really cool. You could just make those flat-out magic duels and just put them in school that one day. And then obviously the, the, the fight with the Dracus, you could just make that a dragon. And you could just say that they were sent out to the village to go find something because it's part of their training. And oh no, there's a dragon threatening this village. And hey, you guys graduated from the first tier. This would be a great opportunity to use the book Strixhaven, the Strixhaven book that came out recently. The whole entire book takes place in an academy and you can cherry pick stuff out of that, take stuff out of the university and King Killer, make yourself a great campaign, make each one of the players have a, a teacher that they are, is their mentor. The only thing that you would have to worry about as a DM is making sure that every session is interesting for your players as there is not a lot of content or combat in the book. Um, so maybe you know your university sends its students out on errands out in the surrounding area to go and maybe uh, maybe combat. some some good opportunities to show how like non damaging or non direct damage spells can be very useful. You mentioned the sympathy duels and I think it could be interesting to be like okay you have to defeat them set some victory condition but they're not going to be like hurling firebolts at each other it's not what you do in school right? I mean you could have that and just have some protections or make it non-lethal somehow. But it'll, like try to make them outsmart each other or use clever spells. That could be pretty interesting if you could set it up that way, you know? Yeah. Whatever you want the victory condition to be, maybe protect this item or something like that. Trying to break um, the other person's concentration. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And especially if you're running this in a higher higher magic setting, why not throw fireballs at each other? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Or magic missiles, and you have to use you have to balance using shield and magic missile in order to break the other person's concentration or something. Oh, yeah. man, having to worry about paying for your tuition could be a very yeah. fun uh, obstacle to have to overcome as a player. Very much so. Yeah, figure out a way to earn money. I feel like that's a great one as a DM to just give very little guidance. Let your players figure something out, you know? Kick uh, them out. Don't, be, don't hesitate to expel these kids. Yeah, sure. <laughs> At a certain point, money becomes not so much of a concern for a and d adventuring party because at a certain point they get a good amount of fame and renown and money just kind of starts getting thrown at them and they, they find the treasure hoard that they then keep and invest in. They have these things that just pay them money now. But before you get to that point, it can be very interesting to, yes, to have them go find ways to earn money, but also you as the DM by introducing, like in the book, we introduce Ambrose, the antagonist, and he creates ways that cost growth money. And if you can create means to not only have your players earn money, but then take that money from them, they're fined because they were caught fighting in the street. What were they supposed to do? This is D&D. Of course, I'm going to defend myself. Well, there's still no fighting in the streets and you're using magic unregistered because you're a university student and that's fined all of your money. Now, how are you going to pay for next tuition? Yeah, it would be very interesting. And honestly, if you put enough NPCs there, your, your players are your players' characters are gonna make some enemies. <laughs> like making a let's uh, here's an idea. I do like that the world has this class system as well. You have nobility and you have gentry and merchant class and all this stuff. Uh, if you were to make a student PC, which way would you go as far as your backstory? Would you think it'd be more fun to have uh, your parents are rich 
or would it be something you'd want to work for? I tend to go for my parents are always someone special. You know, my dad's God, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> not really. I, I I dislike those players. I think the noble kind of background would be pretty. I think noble with a bad backstory. You know, yeah. Maybe it's a disgraced noble, or or just what's it disowned. <laughs> Uh, not, not a great relationship with with dad or mom or whomever um or i and it could be fun just to be the especially if you're like the only one in the group to be the noble who like has access to some money i'm sure there would be caveats that it. it's not just an unlimited source that's kind of on you as the, uh, the dm maybe um it could allow for the players to have fun They're like oh man we we had this great amazing plan but we just need a little bit of cash for this don't worry, I got well, you. Let me write a little letter. <laughs> it's, it reminds me of uh, Justice League 2017 when the Flash asks Bruce Wayne, he's like, so what's your superpower? And he goes, I'm rich. <laughs> so, yeah, that could be fun. And it's always fun to be the, and we see this in the book, the type of noble who's like, oh, you want me to sleep outside? <laughs> Are you kidding me? And that's that's always pretty fun. Um a little bit more so than the the urchin who is fine eating the entire core of the apple. So I think that I would I think I would probably pick as the backstory of a noble, yeah. The only thing is I would find it very entertaining to have to figure out ways to like scrap together some money, you know. Yeah, after we just talked about that, I agree. Taking out a loan. Uh, yeah, having to take out a loan with like a, a dangerous yeah. loan shark who is a, a blood hunter who can track your blood. That's a cool arc, yes. Super cool. Yeah. You need this much? No problem. Just give me some of your blood, and I have access to do whatever I want with your blood. What I can do, you don't know. Depending on what class you are, you may not understand it, yeah. Speaking of, what if you were if you were playing in this setting, what type of class do you guys think you would want to make to play? Arcanist. No question in my mind about it. Arcanist, man. What? A D&D class. <laughs> I'm, I'm stupid. <laughs> I just slipped to Arcanist. We've been talking about him. Artificer. <laughs> An artificer is what I meant to say. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. sure. Artificer would be really cool. I'd want to be an abjuration wizard, but I always want to be an abjuration wizard. <laughs> I don't know. You go, Steve. I don't even think about it again. I mean, as ever, Bard for me. Yeah, of um, course. But then uh, again, yeah. if I had to pick something else, I would probably choose Monk. Monk. Artificer definitely popped into my head. Um, however, the 8M, I think, could be flavored as some sort of traveling monk, maybe, yeah. that you have this fighting skill set that nobody seems to understand, and they kind of berate you for because you're small and slender and you use dexterity instead of strength and then you put somebody on their back with a constitution saving throw or something. That'd be pretty cool. It'd be really cool. Totally. All right, Ryan. Abjuration wizard. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, okay. I might have guessed. <laughs> so apart from the world building, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting is the way that they do the, the main villains, the ones who killed his family, the, Ch the Chandrian. I think the idea of chasing something that's sort of half legend you know not much is known about them and having to kind of follow these clues and see evidence of where they've been in their presence and try to find out more about them could be an interesting way to perhaps continue your campaign from the university or just drop it into whatever setting you like um having to to collect knowledge and evidence yeah if you're the kind of dm who's willing to play the long game with your character's backstories and you have this Chandrian type thing that maybe is connected to multiple different backstories, which would be great for players to have something in common that maybe they find out later. Yeah, the Chandrian offers an amazing opportunity to not only have a side quest in the back of your head, but the second the DM drops one clue, like, oh yeah, someone way down in the city over there reported blue fire before all those people died. All the players, their gears start moving, and they're like, we're going to skip class and we're going to go to this town <laughs> and we'll go figure out what happened. Uh, ears perk up, you know, whenever anything is mentioned from a character's backstory. Uh, so awesome opportunity. The Chandrian is a mysterious, uh, possibly high level adversary. 
So you have opportunities for players to get in over their heads whenever they do confront them. And, you know, by all reports, they can magically get to wherever they want. So, like you said, Ryan, I think it would be really cool to have some sort of event in each character's backstory relating to this ultimate enemy. The Shandrian. One character's parents were killed by it. Another character... You know, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> Not everybody's parents were killed, but something different that involves with... The Chandrian. That they have some connection to it in their past so that when they then see it they have all that same reaction oh my god that's them that's them that's a great storytelling and world building building tool to have in your pocket as a dm is to be able to tell your players hey do your backstory however you want but i want you to include something about this in your backstory and if you don't know exactly what the uh all the qualities of the chandrian will be Make it to where each one of the backstory has to have a secret tragedy that is magical in nature. And then now you have all of the abilities of your Chandrian just by reading their backstories. Yeah. Mm, that's cool. That's well done. Make your players do your work for you. Yeah. yeah. DM yes. smarter. <laughs> um, but you speaking of backstories, and Ryan, you asked a question earlier that was about what type of backstory would you want to have in this setting. It's difficult to really look at backstories because everything revolves so heavily around Voth and what he does all the time. But one character I thought was very interesting was Manette. Manette lives at the university for life, wants to live there for the rest of his life, die there. And he's like 50 years old hanging out with this 16-year-old and these other, other young university students. But by all accounts, he's very knowledgeable, but he's not super powerful in magic or anything like that. So this could be a, a low-level entry character that isn't a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old or something like that. You could have a 50-year-old level 2 wizard right there with your level 2 fighter who's 18 and learning sword forms. Totally and right. And I thought that was so cool that there was this person who's basically the same with all his contemporaries, except for one fact that normally would make him glaringly different. And you can totally ham up that uh, distinction with the different races in D&D. Even more so, yeah. Um, yep. Even more so, yeah. Yeah, but you can play with all the different races too, and you know maybe there's uh, a lot of the masters happen to be elven because they live longer. So uh, what did uh, each of y'all think was your most like D&D moment? Oh. In Name of the Wind. I have one. So the party creates this plan to defeat a dragon without combat, without loss of life, no danger whatsoever. We're going to poison it quietly in the woods. They go to all this trouble. They prepare. They make their intelligence rolls to make sure they have enough of the poison to be able to kill it, so on and so forth. And then they look up. And they realize that they didn't, earlier in the, in the setting, they didn't take the time to persuade the townsfolk not to have the festival. And the DM gets to have this delicious moment of just <laughs> saying the dragon slowly turns its head and sees the glow of the town. And instead of your plan working, adventuring party, you just created this more intense combat scenario that you just now have to do. You have to roll initiative now because <laughs> there are townspeople about to get killed. And I just saw this moment of the adventuring party talking it out beforehand, going into meta conversation, creating this plan, and it working up until the moment where it fails. And, well, roll initiative then. So that one was mine. <laughs> I like uh, the Aeolian. And the fact that there is this, and I plan to use this kind of in the future, that there is this uh, distinguished place for bards that is more prestigious than everywhere else. You know, when Kvoth gets his talent pipes, you know, that is, uh, that is several roles, I feel like. He has to not only do a performance role, and he uh, realizes he's doing a song that requires a duet. It requires a female who not only knows the song, uh, which could be another party member. It could be uh, an NPC that you know, or you could be rolling the dice. You could just roll a D100 and be like, there might be someone in the crowd who can help you, or there might not be. 
and then he just he rolls very well and ends up getting his talent pipes uh, much to uh, the crowd's enjoyment which you know Kvothe is so good at performing and makes everyone moves everyone to tears no matter what sobbing sobbing <laughs> you know how is this young man able to play with only five strings it's at, at least it's consistent throughout this world that people have very emotional reactions to music it seems but Kvothe's the most <laughs> Uh, this really isn't applicable to D D, but I love the thing, the uh, the fact that Ambrose used his own body warmth, sympathy to snap Quoth's strings while he was performing. Oh yeah, uh, a super cool detail there. I don't know how you'd put that in D. I mean, I think that uh, but... you could flavor some spell of s- of Mage something yeah. in, of somebody in the crowd trying to sabotage the person up on stage. I don't know why I just said that. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, I was like, "Why am I saying this yeah, out loud to Ryan?" I need to. I need to write this down <laughs> real quick. For context, Stephen is playing a bard in our current campaign. DM smarter. Thanks, You're Steve. Right. Have your what Nate said. Have your players do the work for you. <laughs> um. So the things things that I thought of were less like specific moments in the book, but more of some some concepts. Um. The first one is just, I think, a good way to play, especially as a DM, a way to narrate things. Quoth, like, a lot of stuff that happens to him, like, he's super skilled. He doesn't do things badly. He just runs into bad luck. Um, And I think as a DM, a lot of the times it's good to narrate things that way. And I've heard this talked about a lot uh, in different circles as DM because, like, your rogue, who is a freaking amazing lock picker, for instance – if he rolls a nat one, it's not going to just be him like fumbling around, like breaking shit because he's you know so undexterous. It, it just have something happen. Um, you know, it could be like recently it happened, like the door. Oh, actually, it turns out it's magically locked, so the lock pick won't do anything. Or you know, a guard has to come around there and you have to stop and hide for a moment. Um, I, I think this is particularly with um, player characters that are very skilled at something. Rolling low, I think, should lean towards, like, something's happened to affect your ability to do this. It's not you just suddenly forgetting how to do something you're very good at or your character is very good at, you know? It often yeah. feels bad when it gets portrayed that your amazing archer misses because yeah. he's just cross-eyed. Or you're this super stealthy person and, no, you step on a twig and it snaps. It's like that's exactly the kind of thing that this character would know not to do, to look out for. So, you know, what else could happen to affect that? There was an example in my last campaign where Ryan was playing a very dexterous character and had to make an acrobatics roll (laughs) in crossing a, a gap, and he rolled a nat one. And so what I ruled... If you remember, it had nothing to do with you. I said the rope snapped. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the rope snapped, and so you fell, and you had to suffer the consequences um, of your nat Perfect one. Perfect example. But that did the nat one in the story had nothing to do with Galen's lack of skills or his own mistakes. And that was very funny, the way you it, – it was a funny situation. I took some damage. I slammed face first into a cliff. Uh and then ended up at the bottom of this ravine. And, yeah, it didn't feel like it was my fault at all. And you're like, you're the last one to cross. So the rope has been worn after all these people have crossed this ravine and stuff. So it, it made it just made a lot of sense and didn't feel bad at all, and it was funny. It can take some some quick thinking and some improv skills to really pull those things off, but when you do, I think it's at great benefit to the players because they don't feel like their character is just a bumbling dummy. You know, I uh, you know. I played this game to get away from my general real life incompetence. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, so my second thing um, that I kind of thought of is it has to do with writing backstories. Honestly, this whole book could be the backstory of someone who has gone a little bit overboard with their their character. Um, I love that description. It, it, like if the his starting with the Edema Rue and learning how to play his music and getting tossed off, boom, that's great level one character backstory right there. You have an explanation for like your class, some of your skills, and that's why I think it's a 
it could be a good example. It's a good example that went a little bit overboard, kind of. Yeah, Kvothe's backstory um, has three different character backgrounds in D&D. Exactly. But it's very good in the sense that you have an explanation for, like, all of these... It, it's like a great backstory for a character that is proficient in every skill, <laughs> which you're not going to be, uh, most likely. That's the bard. Yeah, though. that's the bard. Yeah, it is the bard. Skill monkeys. Because yeah. they get the jack-of-all-trades. But, uh... Especially if your DM likes those thick backstories. Um, yeah, it's a great idea to throw in, like, why are you so good at animal handling? Uh, you know, why why are you so good at the loot? Why Where did you learn magic? Um, yeah, and I think, like, his time with the Edema Rue, there's a performer background. Yep. You know, bam, you get all the stuff out with that background. There's the, the street urchin background from his time in Tarbian. <laughs> yep. And then he has the student or the, you know, the acolyte, I guess, maybe. Sage. Sage, perhaps. So he's got, like, so many backgrounds that you could make different characters out of. When we meet Quoth, he's already beyond the university, so you could give him the folk hero background for his time at the university. True. Could it... (laughs) Can we get a, a a new system where instead of like picking up feats, I can pick up new backgrounds, <laughs> new background features? That would be cool. Super That's cool. That would kind of be interesting, wouldn't it? Because like if it's something you've done that would kind of earn yourself that background. Because you know what, like if we're if we're making quoth, um, probably not folk hero, but I struggle to see any argument that says that he shouldn't have the performer and urchin background. Yeah, because that's just it's just baked into who he is, you know. Um, maybe you don't get maybe you don't get a, a lot of skill proficiencies with it, but he's already a bard, so he's proficient anyway. So yeah, it's a good way to think that uh, you know why does your character have these skills? It's cool to explain that in a backstory, and it opens up a lot of opportunity for your DM to use your backstory. Um, but it also shows why you should consider the scope. <laughs> of what you're building in a backstory, you know, consider what character level you are and what kind of skills you can realistically get. Because there are kind of, uh, I was going to say, there are two ways to create a backstory. No, there's a billion ways to create a backstory, but two of the ways that I'm familiar with are you can build it from what kind of character and class you want. I guess you're like, okay, I want to play a paladin and I want to have these skills because I know they'll be useful and I think they'll be fun. How can I create a backstory where they gain these skills? And then the other way is to just write a really fun backstory and figure out, okay, well, what skills would this character have based on what they've done? You ever um, not know what skills you have, and then you start writing the backstory, and then you're like, oh, I have this skill, I have this skill, as you're writing it? Absolutely. I've probably made the majority of my characters the latter way. I think of a character concept, and then I start thinking, okay, well, what kind of skills would they have? You can start writing it to be like, maybe you don't know what skills they have. You can't decide. And then as you're writing your backstory, it's like, oh, I need to know how to ride a horse. If you need inspiration to write your backstory, though, just pick some random skills. <laughs> Figure or, it out. yeah, roll some dice. Pick the skills. Yeah. It's great many ways of doing it. I am always going to be of the mind to write more into your backstory than less. Yeah. But like you said, Nate, you definitely have to then consider what level you're starting out in this campaign, you know, if you've slain 30 dragons already, are you re- is this really the character to be at level 2 at the start of this campaign? Probably not. So your character probably didn't do that. You got to you got to consider these things and uh yeah, the 25-year-old innkeeper's backstory <laughs> is a little thick. A little, um, little unbelievable. Little excessive. But the the person who enters the university and requests admission for the first time, that 16-year-old his backstory is perfect. Yeah. It's, it's pretty great. He might yeah. have a little much experience with both being with the traveling troop and being a street urchin, you know, like we talked about. But uh, you could make it work. But, you could 100% make it work. But at that point, that's really his only experience. He's not yeah. magical yet. Yeah. He's not trained in fighting. So, yeah, it's a pretty good – I think it's a pretty solid backstory. You got skills. You've got despair. You've got drive. You just totally. got to be a little bit wary. If, if that player came to my table, this guy might have a little bit of protagonist syndrome. Keep that under wraps, and then they'll be good. Or just explain to them. Communicate with your players, dang it. As somebody who loves to play bards and wants to see everyone at their D&D table shine also, 
just a word of advice. Make your bardic, artistic, flashes, inspirational whatevers about your teammates. Totally. I mean, if you play a supportive kind of bard, I think that's kind of the intent behind the class, but if you play you know, the support bard well, and I think you do, you're supporting both the player characters and your fellow players by making things more fun for them. Um, all right. One last thing I want to make sure we get to before we uh, run out of time. The world building fantasy behind the Tinker. Oh, okay. yes. The Tinkers. The Traveling Tinker. Uh, Nate, you did this in, uh, in the last campaign we ran. And actually kind of similar to we started in a university and stuff. But yeah, the, the traveling tinker, this salesman, and this, everyone knows that it's a tinker because he's got a donkey, he's got all this crap, and you're always polite to a tinker. And a tinker always, you know, whenever they request something of you, you always got to give them help because that's just the custom, the culture. Um, the Edema Ru especially, like, I think they, they have this conversation, this, uh, he has this conversation with the tinker um, where the tinker thinks he's lying to him. Because he's telling a pretty ridiculous story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, like, Quoth looks like, he gasps, he's like, what? Dude, I'm one of the Edema Rue. And the Tinker's like, oh, so there's no way you'd lie to me. <laughs> and it's very ingrained in their culture. And that's something I did find very interesting. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Tinker lore. <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> Or yeah. Tinker superstition. High, high Tinker lore. Uh, yeah. But, you know, having a recurring character or something as your players travel who is a Tinker. Or having multiple Tinkers. Um, side quest machine. Yeah, side quest plus a recurring traveling trader is a great way to just get your players to spend some of that gold that they, they they just looted. Maybe get some magic items, you know, in a in a relatively simple way and in a way that they can pick things out, you know. Like, oh, don't know how to spend these next four hours. A tinker comes across. And if this is a reoccurring tinker that they might do side quests for or with, the players might become attached to this character this character can can graduate to bigger, better items that they have for sale. And if they're somehow traveling and somehow meeting up with the party in all these random places, you be careful with how you do this. But as a DM, you might be able to get away with showing this tinker up in a place where they probably shouldn't be able to show up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's just like, oh, the party really needs to buy some rope. Well, I think the the tinker shows up, you know? Well, and the tinker says something about like, oh, nothing can keep me away or something. <laughs> yes. You just play it off funnily. You can get away with it and it can help out your players and they will the players will grow probably grow to love this person. Absolutely. I love the idea of the slightly mysterious friendly salesman who just shows up like I think you're a bit more powerful than you let on. <laughs> yeah, immediately the player is going to be like, so this guy's like a genie, right? Like, he's <laughs> he's he's something. This is God. <laughs> if yeah. you make them helpful, you know, mm-hmm. funny, cheery, mysterious traveling salesman, I think it, rare is the party that will reject such a friend. And just a slight twist on this, but also interesting, is maybe your party kind of hates this tinker. <laughs> and they talk, oh, um, they talk trash to him. They use vicious mockery on him or something like that. Yeah. But it's inside. They appreciate the fact that he shows up again and again. They appreciate the opportunity to bag on him and trash on him. And you know, know your it's players. Still a good, <laughs> it's still a good thing to have in the campaign. It'd be really yeah. funny if, like, say you mess with the tinker a little bit and just a little bit later have something happen to them that's just kind of, Unfortunate, but oh, yeah. <laughs> your it's next five rolls are at disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say nothing crazy, you know. Maybe a little rock falls or one of their things like it seems broken, or you know, you are freaking smited out of existence by the hand of God. <laughs> he is the avatar of luck, and you've pissed him off. Yeah. Oh man, that's a fun concept. Yeah. Lot to lot to draw inspiration from, or even just just take stuff. You can just take stuff. From books still using your campaign. I don't know if you knew that, but <laughs> you could literally take a carbon copy of the university and put it in your campaign if you wanted. And you shouldn't feel bad about it. Everyone does it. Everybody Everyone's does doing it. it, man. Just do it. Everyone's, Everyone's doing, doing it. it. Come on, man. If it's just for you <laughs> and your friends at a table, don't even change the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe don't publish a, a book. <laughs> with don't that do that. Stuff. Yeah, don't publish anything. Don't make money off of it. But 
for a fun thing with your friends, just copy stuff. Before we wrap up, I did have a question for for everyone listening. I had mentioned before, like, you know, if your DM likes a thick backstory, like a long one, I'd be curious, other DMs out there, what kind of backstories do you like? Do you like, you know, a real long, like, Ryan here loves, he, he if we wrote a novel, he'd be happy with it. Um, but, you know, some DMs prefer the shorter, even, like, bullet points or things like that. So if you're a DM, what kind of backstories do you like from your players? Yeah, I'd be curious to see if people are running a long-term campaign. Do they like a couple paragraphs or do they like a couple pages or more? Yeah. Anything you write can and will be used against you in a campaign of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. So, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us and listening to us discuss the name of the wind. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye. The Chandrian.